Today we're making a mountainous tabletop diorama in VR using Gravity Sketch. You don't need any 3D modeling skills to build this because overall this workflow feels more like finger painting than it does 3D modeling. However, when we're done sketching, I'll talk through how I bring my worlds into Blender and procedurally convert them into clean, VR-ready models. As I talk through my entire Gravity Sketch workflow, I also discuss how I approach VR level design overall. So if you're new to Gravity Sketch, this video would be a great way to learn about what's possible in VR. Hopefully by the end of this tutorial, you'll be able to make your own little mountain scene, clean it up in Blender, then upload it to Sketchfab to share with others. I'm Emma, and this is the Spatial Canvas. The rest of this video does not have music, so if you'd like something ambient in the background, I've included a lo-fi playlist in the description below. Just set the volume to about 15 to 20%. Anyways, let's get right into Gravity Sketch. The first thing we're going to do is go into our settings and turn on the world axis so we know where the center of the scene is. And then go to prefabs and put this person into this box to give us human scale. So now when I go down to the home position, we can see that we are the same scale as this person. So this is just going to give us a sense of how big everything is as we're scaling things around. With this person in the scene, we want to make sure that they're in their own layer. So when I make a new one and start drawing things, I can easily just turn this person off or lock it so I can't grab them. This is really nice once we start duplicating them all around the map. That way we don't have to turn off all of them. We can just turn off the one layer. Now let's create a scene that we can put everything on top of. So we're just going to make a new layer here and I'm just going to call it base. So since we want to make everything on a tabletop, I want to go to my primitive objects and then grab just a cylinder. So now when I pull this out, I can create the shape. I want something a little bit rounder than this. So I want to go back in here and say, turn off subdivision object. So this is just going to give us a smoother shape. Now I'm going to go all the way out and I just want to draw a big landscape that we can put our mountains and everything on. You can see it's not centering though. So to make it go center, we want to go and press central line. Now you can see there's a line here that's in where the world axis is. If I was to pull the trigger on my non-dominant hand, I could move it around. And if I fully pull, I can set it like this. This way, my object always goes on the line. But when you bring it close to the world position, it locks to the center. So now it's that we have the center locked, I could just pull the trigger and pull this out as far as I want to go. So now that we have the tabletop made, you can see we lost the person on the inside. So to fix that, we just want to move it down. So if we put our hands on top of each other and highlight the object, you can see this central line that we make. And we can just pull the grab button and now pull it down. So I'm just going to put it right below the axis. I'm actually going to put it a little bit lower down because I'm going to put grass all over on this table. So now we have a platform to work on. Now to give myself a sense of human scale around the map, I'm just going to take this person and randomly place them around. We may lose them as we start doing our sketching, but this just generally helps at the beginning so you don't make any mistakes. Now before we start drawing, we want to first lock in the scale and the base layers. This way we can't go in and accidentally select anything. Next we'll make a layer for rocks and we'll simply call it rocks. Usually what I do for this is I make the bedrock first and then I make layers for the grass, the plants, the trees, and everything else. Now to actually draw the rocks, we want to go to our tools and go to the volume brush and we want to make sure that mixed input mode is on. If we have point mode, then we have to pull the trigger every time we draw a point and that's too slow for the workflow we want. So we'll turn on mixed input and you want to make sure that low poly mode is on. Otherwise, we're going to get something that looks very smooth like this and it can be kind of inefficient too. Lastly, we're going to pick our color. Now don't worry too much about this because since everything is isolated to one layer, if I ever decide that I want to change these colors, I could just go to my layers and say isolate. So now I can just grab everything and change the colors of all of them. Usually what I do is um, if I'm changing the colors, I grab them, I group them together, and then I can come back to the layered mode. So when I go to grab it, I'm grabbing everything on that layer. And then once I pick the color that I want, let's make it kind of a blue color. I just go in and I break them apart. So now they're separate again. Now that we have everything set up, we can start drawing our mountains. What I think I'm going to do is make a little center area for people to exist in. Instead of making it where we have a mountain in the center, 
that kind of falls off to the side. I want to make this kind of like a map, a map that you can jump into in VR. So instead, we're going to have mountains that come up around the outside. Now, don't be too precise with this. You just want to lay down those initial ideas of where those mountains are going to be. You can see I'm falling off my table, so I'm just going to kind of grab and keep on moving in. So we just want to get the initial base mountains in here. Now that we have a general idea of where the mountains are going to be, I've noticed that my human scale isn't really accurate anymore. I want the mountains to feel a lot bigger. So to do this, I'm simply just going to go to my layers, unlock the base, and group both the mountains and the base together on one layer. If I was to go in and scale this, it doesn't really work because everything is turning, so I'm losing that nice even level of the table. To fix this, I'm just going to go into settings and turn on the grid. Now when I grab the object, it stays upright, but I can turn it to 90 degree angles if I want to. So I'm just going to grab it and scale it up, then put it back down. And I'm looking over at all the people as I'm doing this to get it to the scale that I want relative to humans. I don't want to make it too big because I don't want to put too much time on the details. Before you move on, you want to make sure that you ungroup the mountains from the base and turn the grid back off. And now we're back to working where we were. Also going to lock the base so we can't touch it again. Now I need to decide what kind of environment is this going to be. Do I want there to be grass down here or do I want this to be a snowy one? I think I want this to be more of a summer scene. So let's go in and create a layer for grass. Now I'm going to go and pick a color for my grass. I'm going for a little bit more realistic, so I want a more of a yellow kind of desaturated look. Make sure you have the volume, volume brush selected. And now we can start layering in some grass. You can be really loose here. We just want to get a sense for where the ground is going to be. What's cool too, and this is kind of the whole point of this tutorial, is that now we can start blending in these cracks between each of the mountains. And this is something we're just going to do over and over again, and it gives it this really natural look, as if the mountains were pushed up from the ground instead of just being placed on top of the landscape. I also want to lean into this aesthetic that this is just a tabletop uh, diorama, and so I'm going to make sure that the grass kind of bleeds to the edge here perfectly. The beauty of working with the volume brush is that it works really well with a boolean operation inside a blender. So don't worry too much about making too many objects because everything is going to be synced down to a single object in the end and you won't get any of this overlapping that's going on inside. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, and it retains the color details as well. So we could actually use the colors from these materials as IDs that we can then use in Substance Painter. Okay, I just want to clean up the edges a little bit more here. So as I'm working here, you may notice that you can see all the lines in the grass as if they're rocks. That's because Gravity Sketch doesn't have smooth shading for low poly mode. It does help while you're working because you can get a sense for what the geometry is. But don't worry about that for the final look because once we bring it into Blender, we're going to be making all the grass look smooth. Before moving forward, I want to make sure that when I press the home button that I don't clip into the map like this so I can easily go back to test how everything works. So I'm just going to unlock all of our layers, including the base, and use our precision mode to move things down. Then I'm going to go to scale and make sure that we have a couple of humans here in the center to test stuff out. Then I'm going to go into brass and just make sure that we have a nice flat plane where you first load into the map. Especially for VR stuff, you don't want to start on something too slanted right away. Uh, since this can give people motion sickness, you just want to intro someone to your environment slowly. And then you can start introducing all the hills. Cool. So now when I go home, I'm not clipping through the map. I'm going to turn off human scale. I'm just kind of get a sense for how this looks. Before moving on to any detailing, I did want to make these mountains snow-capped. 
So I'm going to go back into our rocks, make sure the base is locked, and draw some higher tips. Now don't worry about how this is blending just yet. We're going to go back in later to really make it look like it's a rock. But I just want to get that extra height in. Now the thing with snow-capped mountains is the snow usually starts at a certain elevation. So to figure that out, we're going to make a new layer, just say L, and let's create a new cylinder. You want to make sure that your point's at the center, and just like the base, we're going to draw out a cylinder, but make it extra flat this time. Now we're going to move it down to probably about here. Then I can lock this layer and turn its visibility down to almost nothing. Now you can see we have a really nice line that tells us where the snow should be. Move it up a little bit more. So I'll go back and now make a new layer and call it snow. Then we'll go back to the volume and I'll change this to a white color. And start drawing in our snow. And I want it to stop mostly at where this line is. Now I hope you can see what's happening here of just by kind of pulling the snow out, it's making that natural falling look that you would normally see on a mountain. So again, just kind of being imprecise here, not worrying too much. And although it looks sharp right now, once we bring it into Blender, we'll smooth everything out. I want to be careful of not adding too much detail up front because I do want to go back into these rocks and add a bit more detail there. I just want to get the general sense of where this is going before uh, I get too far into the micro details. Now I want to note that if I was to go in and turn off our vertical lock and flip this table over, some things are clipping through. Now that just is, it's based off of what you want to do. But if you want to make this a table, you might want to go back in and clean this up before getting too far into the design process. Now you might be thinking that if you were just working in Blender, you could select everything, select all the vertices and move them up. The problem with that is you wouldn't retain the nice uh, convex shapes, which work really well with booleans. So the minute you break these into uh, concave shapes, the boolean starts breaking. Nice. So now we have this table and just for fun, let's turn the vertical lock on and make some legs for our table. So I'm just going to say sub D, polar symmetry to four, and mixed input mode. So I want to make sure that my symmetry tool is at the center. And then draw this down. And go into edit mode and then I could just simply extrude it out. Make sure that it's all closed up. And just to fix efficiency and everything, I'll delete this face. And then I'll go in and add one more cylinder. Bring that down. Let's make this a wood table. There we have it. So now I can turn off our elevation and then lock our base. And we now have this cool tabletop mountain environment that we're working with. So as I flesh out these next details, I'm thinking a lot about what this place would look like if you were in VR. I want to think of having some elevation zones for people to stand on. And I'm going to start moving our people over to those elevation zones. So let's say we have something there. Then over here, we have another lookout spot that someone could be. Move this person to that zone. And I will start thinking about, well, how would someone even get to this? And I'll think of drawing a little ramp out here. And maybe it's a cross pathing ramp like this. Along the way, you may notice that some of your old creations don't really match up, so you just have to start editing them. And I do this thing where I just follow the movement of the rocks. So I'm thinking about what does this rock look like over time? How did it kind of break apart? You would think of it as there's these separate layers of the rocks. And you can have these inflection points in the rocks where there's some like cross 
um, details going on. So I'm just following the core lines of the rocks here. I don't want to get into too much detail just yet because we have this whole map to work with. So you really have to pace yourself with this. Now, if this was just aesthetics, you wouldn't really have to worry about the, the teleporting aspect. But since we're making this in VR, you might as well make it something that would be fun and easy to explore in VR. Right here, I was realizing this might be a little bit too much stone. Because I would love to make this more of a canyon type of thing that someone can move through. So I'm just going to go in and move these pieces over and try to construct a canyon by just moving these concave shapes. Great. Now jump over to grass. Let's fill this in to make this kind of like a nice path that you can move through. I love having overhangs like this that people can hide underneath. And just keep thinking, how does someone get to this point? What do they have to do? And you don't have to make it too easy either. This one I made a direct path that you can just teleport right up here, but maybe in order to get to this zone, you have to go all the way around to the back. So how can we facilitate someone to walk through this path and go up to these rocks? What I'm going to do is try to bake that out with the grass. So let's say they walk around this way. Careful with your elevation. Make sure you check it from here. You don't want to make something too steep or else people will feel like it's not a zone they can walk up. So just keep on kind of zooming in, making sure that it looks good from the human scale angle. And again, don't be afraid of editing the shapes that you've already made before. What I'm noticing here is that I don't have a sense of human scale. So I'm going to bring a person over here. And sure enough, I actually thought this was a lot smaller than it actually was. So I'm glad I checked. Now let's consider this area here. Do we want to allow people to come up here and walk around this outside? If not, we should cut this off now. But if we do, we should try to think of how we can mold this grass landscape. I actually think I want to pull people up into the mountain here. So I'm just going to draw some grass around like this. And we have this canyon, so I want to make sure that I'm also gradually dipping this down so people can eventually come back down to the floor. If at any point you want to focus just on the grass and moving things around, you can always just lock your rocks layer. Oh, okay, so here's a problem. This happens sometimes where I accidentally start putting my grass onto the rocks layer. So try to catch this as early as possible so then you can just go in and move it over. This is something that Blender does have over Gravity Sketch, where normally I could just say, select all the materials um, that are similar to this one. But in this, you have to kind of do it by eye. But if you're uh, very aware of how you're managing your layers, you won't run into that problem. I almost <laughs> did it again. So we're starting to get a pathing system in. Let me just finish off this underneath layer here. And then I want to go through and do a quick play test. And just keep reminding yourself that the reason you're doing this this way, instead of just going in and taking like a terrain map and having it like auto generate in Blender or whatever, is because the doing it by hand is giving us this very unique poly style that you normally wouldn't get by just auto creating this with some kind of um, sculptor or terrain generator. See this kind of like handmade uh, look that you're getting here? But also, this is extremely low poly especially once we boolean everything together. Now, just for fun, I do want to try a different environment. So let's turn on HDR. This is just a skybox I made in Unity. I baked it out using the recorder as an 8K skybox, and then I dropped it into the HDR folder in Gravity Sketch on my uh, PC. And then you can just go into here and select it once you have HDR mode on. This works on the Quest 2. You just have to drop that file over using landing pad. But now we have like a nice new look to our scene. So now we can go home and we can start testing this out. So I'm just going to grab the teleporter and start moving around the map.
I'm going to turn percentage mode on so then I can scale to make sure I'm going to human scale. So it would take a long time to add in all the details to make it look good from that human scale. But I think adding in that logic makes it look that much cooler from this perspective here. So even though we're not kind of making it for that human scale perspective, I do still want to be thinking as if we are. Like the more you scale it down too, the more you can really see the logic behind this pathing that we're making. So let's continue. Uh, I'm going to make a couple of different pathing options over here. Now, if we wanted to, we could start having some fun with adding in extra elements that aren't just rock and grass. So let's say this was kind of like a chasm where there wasn't much left for the rocks. So let me just move this whole piece. We could add a bridge between these. So I'm just going to do a quick gray brought box of a bridge. And later on, we can figure out how we want to actually design this. So let's add a new layer. Let's just say objects. And I'm going to change the mode to two hand input. So now I can use two hands to build it. And I want to make the size based off of this human here to make it kind of proportional. I want it to just be a walking bridge. So it's probably good. Put it between these two and then I'll make it a little thinner so it's more like planks. And then later on, we can figure out how we want to actually build this out. I'll probably do a bunch of planks with like a, a handrail or something that goes along it. And just for fun to continue this visualization out, let's add in some nice beams. You could work with sub D beams if you wanted to. I'm just doing this because this is uh, a little quicker. So while interviewing Don Carson from Walkabout Mini Golf, uh, he really inspired me to focus less on trying to make things precise and really lean into the fact that these things are handmade. They said that at Walkabout, their uh, mantra is that they're being honest and like showing uh, that they're, everything's not super precise and it really works out for them. It makes everything feel more organic. Crossbeam there. Cool, we have a little bridge going on. Now it's critical that when you start adding in these kind of objects that these are on separate layers because when you're doing your booling operations, if any of these non-convex objects are in there, your boolean operation will probably fail. So just be very mindful of where your layers are. It's going to be a little annoying and you're going to forget a lot, but after a while it feels pretty natural. Now I've been looking at these colors for a little bit too long, uh, so I want to mix things up. So I'm just going to solo all my rocks. This is a good point for me too, to make sure that I haven't added any grass materials to it. And then I'll group those together. And I'll do the same thing for my grass. Group it all together. Unsolo. And now we can play with the colors. So I think I want to make it a little bit darker. And same thing with the grass. I'm not very excited about this sky, so let's just turn the HDR to just the gradient, and now we can just pick our own colors. This allows us to be a little bit more toony, I think, which is the aesthetic I'm going for. At this point, we can start thinking about what other objects we want in the scene, too. So let's add in some trees, see what that looks like. Now, for trees, there's a couple of ways to do it. For me, I like trying to make things as low poly as possible early on. So I'm going to go in and add a cylinder, turn on subdivision and say customize and draw out a base. I'm going to make it more than four, so five and then say confirm. And then delete the bottom. So now we have this base shape that we can work with. Usually after I do something like this, I go down to human scale and I just like kind of judge it based off of the, the person there. Probably should go to human scale too. just be like, is this a tree? I usually say like, can I hug it? Like how, how big is it actually? So I'll make it a little bigger. That's about tree size. And then we're just going to kind of keep this over here as a prefab that we can go back to and then make a new one. I'll make it kind of a dark wood color. And then instead of, there's a couple of ways to do this. We could grab from the top and then start doing this kind of thing. Or 
we could have grabbed the object and finished where we wanted the tree to end. So do something like this. And then add subdivisions along the way that we could then warp. I tend to think that this is a little bit easier to work with because you're going to have to be editing it like this later on. Plus, if you wanted something more like a, a straight tree with just slight curvature, this makes that easier. With trees, they usually, their bases go out a bit more. And if you want the base of your tree to be here, I would suggest going a little bit lower just so things can intersect pretty easily like this. So you're not accidentally floating above the map. It's not the most efficient if you're doing some light baking, but it does make things just look a little cleaner if you're working quickly. Just add a quick tree chop. And then again, to be super efficient, I'm going to now use a cube that's four sided. So we're not using the five sides and wasting those vertices. And then since both sides aren't going to be revealed, I'm going to delete those faces, give this the same color as the tree, and then just place it in. And same thing with this, I'm going to bring it up into the, the tree and then start adding in my subdivisions along the way. Now I can just take this one and move it around the map. I'm being really loose because I'm probably going to redo this later on. I just wanted something to work with to start placing where my trees are going to be. So let's go to the home position now. Yeah, that's a pretty cool tree. So first make sure that it's on one layer. And now let's just start figuring out some positions that we can place trees. Just duplicate them around the map. Doesn't matter if you don't really get it right, but it's good to just get a feeling for it. Now this is going to be a low poly map with really nice lighting that will give it a realistic look. So you don't have to add too many of these trees. Again, if we want this to run in VR, we don't want to go too uh, intense with the poly count. But what I am trying to do here is make everything kind of even so there's not too many close batches of trees. Cool. Let's see what it looks like from the home position. Nice. Now we're starting to get a map that feels like an actual place. I love how over there we can see the, the bridge in the distance. We get that really nice sense of scale. Let's test it out from all the different viewpoints. And actually, this is a good moment to talk about viewpoints. So Gravity Sketch has this option where if you go to viewpoints here, you can then take a picture from like a, a point of view that you want to teleport to really quickly. So let's set one here. It um, tracks your scale as well. So wherever you go for these viewpoints, make sure that you have percentage scale on and that you lock it down to a that human scale. But in like this instance, like if I wanted one up here, I could do it from this scale, but I want to get all these first. So let's say we have one from like beginning of the bridge. That's a cool one. The other thing about these is that if I, if I grab it, and press the edit button, I can then take a picture. And this is this is what's really cool. This means we can then do progress shots. So I can take a picture of from all my viewpoints from here, then keep on working and then take a picture again. And then we can do some like side by sides later on to show how the map improved. So if you want, you can be a little precise, try to get that framing now, uh, just so you have a nice composition. And you can see that changing this field of view doesn't change your the way you scale over to it. So now let's, 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 let me just show you what it's like. So when you have your viewpoints open, if you go to your dominant hand and press left and right on the joystick, you're teleported to all your different viewpoints. Now, if you're new to VR and you know you're kind of prone to motion sickness, um, I would definitely go into your settings and go to preferences and say comfort level to blink mode, because this makes it just kind of blink between all of them. You may notice that this is in front of you, which is annoying. So just press this I and it gets rid of the, the view. So now you can really quickly go to all your viewpoints and see how things look. All right. So from here, I am just going to start filling out the details. 
just keep trying to think about the logic of these rocks. If there is an overhang here, then that kind of means that the rocks might have broken up. So let's draw some rubble down here at the bottom. Now, I want to add a little staircase here. But before I do that, I want to make sure that it's the right height for this person. So I'll make a little step. Make sure the step's big enough, and then I'm just going to duplicate it up. Sometimes you might have a piece here that is just too big and you don't want to work with it, so I just move it back and then I design something new on top. I just noticed here that I had a balcony, but I had no way to get to it. So I just want to go back here and edit in a little entryway from this pathing. And if this was some kind of larger project, you might want to spend a little bit more time on your pathing before you get into this. But I also think it's kind of fun to just come up with it as you go if it's for a very innocent project like this. I want to make a bridge here. So instead of starting over, I'm just going to grab this bridge we already made. Just like take parts of it and just put it right on top. One thing to remember is that you don't necessarily need detail for something to look good. Sometimes just having a really nice pattern to the overall rocks is good enough. For this, I had a really flat plane of rocks. So I just decided I want to have some really nice overlaps go across this whole face. Now remember, what we're going to do is eventually we're going to go back into grass and we're going to start filling in these gaps. Be very careful of having this kind of trapped space because this is going to mess up our booleans. We can always go back and clean that up later, but just it's good to keep an eye on that early on so you don't have a headache trying to fix everything later. I'm going to go in here and start adding in a little snow detail because as of now, our snow has been a little lacking. So I want to show it kind of falling into the regular area. Having little dots of it everywhere. Showing the point where the snow stopped being full on and kind of transitioned more into melting. If we wanted to, we could introduce a little ice. So I'll just make a new layer, I'll put it under snow, and select the reflective material now, and make it a little blue. We don't have to give it that much color since we have HDR on though, so the color will mostly come from the sky. And just whenever we have this, these kind of dams, I'm just going to add in some ice. As if the snow is just melting and turning into ice, and then eventually this ice will transition into grass. Now, if you wanted to get really picky, we could start adding in another element of mud. Because maybe the snow doesn't go straight into grass. Maybe it goes to mud first. So let's get a nice brown. Get rid of these two brush strokes that I made. And then around the ice, I'll put in some mud. Then we can go back to grass and then start adding in some grass. Now imagine this amount of detail, but on the entire map. I don't know if we're going to get that, but it's, it's what you can strive to do. Before I get too far in the details on the rocks, I just want to make sure that I finish all my pathing out. So I'm just going to keep on adding in grass to the path. These edges can be difficult, so usually I just Try to do my best and then I clean them up later on. Just keep reminding yourself that even if you're working with the grass, it doesn't mean that you can't just switch over to the rocks and then fill in a gap. Like instead of editing this grass right here, I could just add in another little rock edge. And what I'm doing here is I'm giving these kind of ribs to the side of this mountain. And it doesn't look the best right now. But 
once I fill in the snow and the ice in between each of these ribs, it's going to look really cool. I like adding these kinds of veins of grass because later on I can go in and add some leaf sit to make it look like this is more like foliage that's overgrowing on top of the, the rocks. At this point, instead of adding just the same kind of grass, I want to go in and pick a different color of grass and make a different layer for it uh, so I can keep things separated. And for this, I'm just going to go around and make a couple of circles in the grass, uh, try to add some little details in it. I don't want to do something where it's like one section is all green and one section is all dark green. I kind of want to make it look like it's um, spotted throughout the entire landscape. So you can, of course, do this however you want. I'm more just showing that at this part of the detail process, this is when I start introducing those secondary colors and more elements like mud and so forth. Now let me show you the flexibility of this workflow. If I was to go in and select everything and group it, and now select grass 2 and group it, and now select the rocks and group those, Watch how we can completely change the look of this landscape. So let's make the rocks maybe more of like a tan color. And then maybe the grass is a blue. And then the grass detail is a dark blue. Now I'll go into the sky and pick some different colors to match this. So it's a completely different landscape now, and this really helps if you just want to change up the vibe as you're working so you don't feel like you're just looking at the same thing constantly. Now I'm going to focus on putting in my last details with one kind of rock color, and then I want to go back and start adding in a secondary rock. So I was having some trouble with my shadows where I couldn't really see things because the light was like this. If that happens, you just want to take your light and then press the anchor button. And this just makes sure that it stays over your shoulder. So I kind of just put it over my shoulder and then to the side slightly so I can see things. And don't forget to add little spots of details in parts of the map where the rocks aren't. So if I just add little pebbles around the outside of these main rocks. It goes a long way to make it feel like there is actually more detail on this rock than there really is. The hardest part of this whole workflow is just going to be getting a feeling for where you should be putting your time and where the details should be. At first, you might not get this clean of a look, uh, but you just have to keep on trying it a few times. That's why I think working on a large scale map is actually pretty helpful because it gives you a chance to work on this like over and over again in different ways and uh, try out different things. Like earlier when I made this, I realized that since there's an overhang here, it might make sense to put some mud underneath because maybe that area doesn't see as much light. And then now I can come back to this area and maybe I'll add in a little mud there because of this logic. If I wanted to, you can see that I just kind of drew on top of these pieces here. If I wanted to, I could have gone back in and uh, changed those. But it doesn't really matter because like I said in the end, anything that's inside of these models is going to be deleted when we use the booleans later on. Okay, we're getting close to the point where I want to export out into Blender because I'm starting to get some frame drops in headset, so what I usually do is bring it into Blender and then combine things down based on their materials and then bring them back into Gravity Sketch so we're only working with just a few objects that we can paint on top of. But before I do that, I just want to make sure that everything is in place the way I want it to be. So I want to make sure that my pathing is the way I want it and so forth because we can't edit those objects later on in Gravity Sketch. So all I'm going to do is solo the grass and the rocks and then now I'm going to go to export. So at this point, I'm getting some frame drops in my headset. So I want to export out the majority of my brushes and combine them down into single objects in Blender. In the future, I hope this is something we can do in Gravity Sketch. But for now, the workflow is this. 
I'm going to find my layers with the most objects. So I get frame drops even if I'm using just the rocks. So I'm going to do the rocks and the grass, but I'm not going to select any of the details yet. So with these soloed, I'm going to go to save and export. Make sure I'm saving locally so this goes straight to my computer. If you're working wirelessly on a Quest 2 or Pro or any other headset, you would want to save to the cloud and then pull this from landing pad, but I'm working locally. So then you just say export. For exporting, we want to export it as an FBX in centimeters. And then advanced settings, we are exporting the mesh. We want all our vertices to be welded together. We want to use the control mesh, which is a little irrelevant for the piece we're working on. And we want all the pieces to be organized in the layers that we have set up, not as the pieces that we have grouped together. So then we just say go. And before jumping over to the computer, I do want to make sure that we get everything saved out just in case. Now let's call this mountain table four. Once your object's in Blender, you can see that each one of our brush strokes are actually their own individual objects, which is why we are getting so many frame drops in the headset. So the goal here is to combine all those together so we can import it in as just one object for the grass and one object for the rocks. So to do this, there's a couple of things we could do. First, if we go over into the hierarchy and unroll the main object, we can see our two layers for the grass and the rocks. So if I was to right click the grass, I could say select hierarchy. And now that selects all of the grass. But just in case we accidentally added a couple of the rocks to this layer, we could also just select one of the grass pieces and then press shift L, which will give us all the options of things that we can select that are similar to the grass we selected. So if I say material, It'll select every object in the scene that has the same material as the grass I selected. Now, if I right click, I can say join or press control J to combine them together. Finally, we want to get it outside of this container here so we can bake in all the transforms. So we just want to make sure our object is selected and then press alt P. And then we'll say clear and keep transformation. Now we can see it's on the outside. If I go to our object's information, we can see that we have all these numbers for its location, rotation, and scale, but we want to just center all this out. So I am just going to press um, Control A and then say All Transforms. So that just bakes everything down. Now it's just a matter of doing the same process for the rocks. So watch how fast you can do this with the keyboard shortcuts. If I press Rock, just say Shift L, select all the materials. Control J to combine them down, then Alt P to clear and keep the transformation, then finally Control A so we can apply all the transforms. So at this point, we are pretty much good to go to export. But before we do that, I just want to make sure the shading is nice. So I'm just going to select both of our objects, right select and say shade flat. Now, if you get a result like this, that doesn't look like uh, what you had in Gravity Sketch. Just make sure your objects are selected and press tab. This goes into edit mode and then press alt N, which will give you your normals menu. And we just want to say reset vectors. Now, if I press tab again to um, go back to regular object mode, it should look like it looks in gravity sketch. By the way, if you're curious of how I am moving around the scene like this, I use a device called a space mouse by 3D Connection. And this is really important for my workflow because it's hard going back and forth between VR movement and then 2D movement with a mouse. So this just gives me the closest um, version of VR movement on my 2D screen. It's also just really fun to fly around the map. All we need to do now is select both of our objects, go to File, Export, and then Export as an FBX. And then you just want to make sure to export it into your import library. And then before exporting, just make sure you say selected objects only in case you have other objects in your scene and then export. Now that we're back in Gravity Sketch, we want to go to our layers and turn off the rocks and the grass and then create a new layer for import. Then we want to go to our prefabs and find where we saved the file. You just click it, it'll load in and you just want to grab it and then put it back in place. And as long as you export it out in centimeters in Blender, everything should just be back where it was. You can say, check. Now we're in the scene. So everything's running a lot more smoothly for me now. 
If I go in to select these objects, you have to ungroup it first, but now you can see that this is one object that can't be ungrouped any further. Now for the rocks and grass layer, it's up to you how you want to manage that. In the past, I retained those layers and called them backups and then made two more and then just hit these, but I never really went back to save them. And if I ever need those files again, we did save things in iteratively. So I could go back and then uh, import those. But for this, I don't think I need them. So I'm just gonna go to rocks, delete them, go to grass, delete those. And now we have these two clean layers that we can work with. So now I'm going to make another layer for a second kind of rock. This is just gonna be a, a little bit darker rock. I'm just gonna find some crevices between the rocks and throw this in there. This is also a good time to start cleaning stuff up. Like having this little indent there doesn't look good. So I'm just gonna cover it up with this secondary rock. And every time you see an area where there's like a hole that shouldn't be there, just cover it up. Don't worry about having to edit the original rocks that made the hole. Now, originally I've been advising to jump all around the map to edit like that. But at this point in the detail process, that usually drives me a little mad. So now I'm just gonna focus on one mountain at a time. So I'm just gonna work on this mountain until I'm happy with it. And then this is going to set the tone for how much detail I'm going to add on all the other mountain tops. I don't like how this is like this cone effect. So I'm going to see if I can use some of the original rocks to clean that up. Just going to cut into it a little bit. But you want to be aware of adding details that don't make sense. So if you're going to cut in like this, really try to integrate it into the rest of the mountain. Now, until now, you've kind of seen me draw all my uh, details by hand. But when you're trying to make some small details, you could just do something like this. I usually avoid that because it does save me a little time, but now I have the stress of, well, each one of those look exactly the same, and we start losing that made by hand feeling. But that's just a personal preference. Before going forward further, I wanna to try to integrate this snow into the landscape a bit more. So to do that, I'm just gonna start showing little bits of snow around the area just to show that there was some kind of fall off from where things were snowy to where it turned into grass. Yeah, it's subtle, but just having these little white dots does goes a long way to making things blend. I've noticed that when I'm making these kinds of tutorials, I start talking a lot softer. So I hope I'm not mumbling too much, like go into full Bob Ross mode. I'm not liking how chunky this grass is over here, but watch how we can make that work for us. So instead of trying to fill it in or fix that grass, I could just build in some rocks along, around, along the edges and try to make it seem purposeful. Yeah, this is a pretty big hole. Um, so that kind of thing you definitely want to try to cover up. Just keep an eye out. The further, this is another one that's kind of bad. The further you get into this process, um, the more of those you can just clean up. And here at the top of these spikes, I'm just trying to make it look like the snow is clumping up a little bit more. Just adding a bit of intention to this. Well, now I want to explore the trees a little bit. So I have these main trees, but maybe I want to add a secondary tree. So I'm going to duplicate this object and ungroup it so I can just get the base. And I want to make some very simple pine trees. There's a couple of ways to do it, but I think I'm just going to do it with a cylinder. So let's turn customize on. And I'm going to bring in the top. Just 
scrunch in the middle. And then have the bottom kind of flay out like this. And now I'm just going to multiply it and bring it up. Rotating it as I go just to add a little variation. And I'll just give this a different kind of tree color. So I'm just going to make sure the whole thing is on one layer. And then I'll call these pines. Now before moving on, I want to check it to human scale. Make sure this is what I actually want. And now I'm going to make them around the map. So I'm just rotating them and scaling them a bit as I duplicate them around the map, trying to make it seem like there's some variation. Just be careful with your scaling that you're not losing that realistic human scale look. And also be mindful of your paths. I don't want to put a bunch of them right in the middle of this because I have a path that's leading this way. And I'm going to hold off on duplicating these until I add in the same details on the other mountains. All right, so we have four mountains here that we have to add these details to. So this one's done. Now I'm going to move over to this whole section here and try to just do it all in one go. Yeah, again, just switching up the sky just so things don't feel as boring as I'm working. So while working on the second mountain, I just realized that this stripe effect looks really good. So I'm just going to go back and just add a little bit of it back to the first mountain. Just a little bit, though. I don't want to get too lost on going back and trying to touch everything up. Honestly, I find setting some kind of like timer or something to give me a sense of how long I'm working has been really helpful. One, to just like convince me to go a little bit longer, but also to remind me to get out of the headset and take a break. Okay, I'm going to add some grass now to this. So I haven't done a check in VR in a while, so I'm just going to kind of rotate between my viewpoints. These mountain views look really cool, but then once you get down to, but once you get down to these kind of areas with the grass, it's really uneven. So I think I would want to put a little bit more detail in between so the walking feels a little bit more consistent. Um, also, I am noticing a lot of frame drops now, so I'm going to do a larger export now where I'm going to turn off the trees and the objects, but then export everything else and combine it down in Blender. Okay, so now that we have it imported back into Blender, I'm going to do the same workflow as I did last time. So I'll select the rocks, can do Shift L, Material, Control J to connect them all and then Alt P to take them out of this grouping. And then I'm going to press H to hide, just so we know what we're working with. Now we're doing Rock 2, so I'm just going to do Shift L, Control J, and Alt P. And then H to hide onto the snow. And you can see that you can move pretty quickly if you just use these keyboard shortcuts. All right, and then I'll select all those objects and unhide them. Now you can see that there's smooth shading on them, so I'm going to select them, right click and say flat shading. Oops, <laughs> all the objects flat shading. And now we have it looking like it did in Gravity Sketch. And now this is probably the coolest part of everything. Uh, I didn't want to use this too early on, but if we use a gradient texture like this, and we apply it to any of the objects, we get some really, really nice shading. 
So I'm going to turn that on and then set it to flat mode and then set it to whatever rock color I want. And it looks super cool like this. So I'm going to do the same thing for the grass as well. Now it's important to do this next step extremely carefully because this will decide whether things will work properly in Blender or not. Essentially, when we combine all these objects together, we want to make sure that there's no trap space and that we can easily delete the bottom half of the entire map. In order to do that, it's best if we just add one giant object that can just clip the entire bottom half of the map out. So we're just going to go around using the volume brush and make one big object that covers everything on the bottom half. Then I decided that my scene would look a lot better if I added actual trails to all my paths. So I just created a simple plane and then I extruded that along a line across the entire map wherever I had some kind of pathing. I also used this time to add planks to the bridges to make them feel more detailed and real. Finally, I thought it'd be good if I add a little of the brighter grass details onto the darker areas to give it just a little bit more variation. At this point, we can do our final export to bring things into Blender to start the Boolean operation. Now that we're back in Blender, I'm going to show how we can use Booleans to combine this entire model down so we don't have all this intersecting data in between the map. So we'll make it really clean and make it so we can actually bake textures on top of it. But you don't necessarily have to go this route if you don't want to. You could export this straight into something like Unreal Engine and still get some really nice results. If you want to see the stats of your object, you can go up here and press statistics. And you can see that we're at 87,000 vertices, which for a large scale map like this, that isn't that much. It's definitely going to be pushing the limits if you're trying to launch this on something like the Quest 2. But still, it's much better than if this was sculpted in something like Z a ZBrush without any decimation. To move forward, we need to isolate the volume brush strokes from all the trees and other objects. Normally, you would want your trees to be based on an instance, so it's not rendering the same tree over and over and over again, and it's just using one base model. But to make things easier here, I'm just going to select all my tree objects and con combine them down. Same thing with all my tree trunks and these tree tops. I'm just going to select all of these models, press M, which is going to move it to a new collection. We'll make a new collection called Trees. Now this is still part of the hierarchy, so I'm going to press Alt P to clear and keep its transforms. And then I'm going to hide the Trees folder. Now if I dive into our hierarchy a little bit, you can see um, our different layers. So we don't need all these cameras. These are showing our viewpoints. So I'm just going to delete those. We don't need the lights. And then in meshes, we're going to find our objects folder, select the hierarchy, and then just combine these together. I'm going to do Alt P and then move to a new objects collection. Now, the only other thing that's not a volume brush in this scene is the path. So I'm just going to grab that and then move it to the objects folder as well. Looks like we have a couple extra spare path pieces. So I'm going to combine those and then press M to move to the objects folder. Lastly, it looks like the table is there. So uh, combine those and then move that to the objects. So now we're left with just the volume brush strokes. Now, if you're wondering why your scene is all black and white, that's because Blender imported in the texture of the gradient from each material, but it didn't import the color that you add, but you apply it on top of that texture in Gravity Sketch. So to get that, what we need to do is to select one of our objects and then go down into the shader graph. And then we need to add an RGB node and then add a mix RGB node. So now I can just wire this into that. And if I select color, we can now see that it's mixing it over. I'm going to change this to multiplier. 
because with multiply, we're uh, keeping the original texture as well. Now I'm just gonna select these two nodes, press Control C to copy, and apply these to the rest of the scene. Now we have our colors back and we've retained the nice shading that comes with using the gradient. Before I move forward, I want to select all of our rocks, say Control L, a material, and then right click and say shade flat. And I want to make sure I do this for our secondary rock material as well. Now we want to select all the objects and then separate by material. To do that, we want to press A, which is going to select everything that's in the scene. You need to select any random object and then say Control J. And this finds all of it as a single object. Now you can say Alt P to separate it from the base. And now you can see we have all these empty objects that we can just go in and delete. Now, if I press Tab and then press A to select everything, if I press P, it will separate. It will give me the separation window. And I'll say By Material. And you'll see I made an object for every one of these materials. So if I go and check, I can select one of them and press G to move. And sure enough, it's only moving the objects from a single material at a time. Now, the only reason I do this step is just to make sure that there aren't any other spare materials in the scene. So I just kind of go through and hide to see what materials I have. And like for this one, like this, for instance, I'm not sure what this is linked to, but it's still its own object, which is probably means it's just a spare brushstroke that I made with a random material. So I'm just going to delete that. Now, before moving on, it's a good practice to name your materials. So just go through and give these all names. This is important because our next step is to recombine these down. So I'll select these objects and then say Control J. And now, even though all these are uh, connected, over in our materials, we can see everything is isolated. So I see I have one material here I didn't name. So if I want to figure out what those objects are, I can press Tab with my object selected and then say Select. Ah, so this is the, the base material that I'm going to be using to chop the bottom of the map off. So I'll just give this the name Base. Yeah, at any point, if I wanted to just select the grass, I just have to select that material and say select, and it will only select the grass. So it's really, it makes things a lot easier in the future if you really need to isolate things. Now, we want to name this and then press Shift D to duplicate it. Now I want you to press M to move it to a new collection and call this Baker. The naming doesn't matter, it's just to let you know where everything is. And I'm going to move this map raw to a backup folder. Now in Baker, what we want to do is press tab, select all of our objects, and then press P to separate by loose parts. So this is basically just going to separate everything back into their original brush strokes. So if I go around and select things, you can see that all these original objects are still there. And the reason we wanted to move it to a collection beforehand was because there are thousands of objects here. So by putting it here in the collection, we can just roll this up. And this is where it gets really fun, but it can also crash your computer if you don't have something that's powerful enough. So before moving forward, make sure that you save. Now, what we want to do is take this base object that we made and we want to press M to move it to the scene collection, to move it on the outside. We don't want it to be part of this Baker folder. And I'm just going to duplicate it so we have a backup of this if we want, and just place it there. And then make sure that we hide the backup folder. This way, the only thing that's visible in the scene is everything in Baker and this bottom base piece. Now, what I'm going to do is press the base piece then go over into our modifiers and we want to give this a Boolean modifier. What we're going to be doing is combining the objects. So you want to press union and then you want the operation to look at a collection. So we're going to point this collection to the Baker folder here. 
So we can just press this and then say Baker. And the moment you press this, it's going to start the operation. And the thing is, this will work, but it would just might take your computer a while to do. So just press it and walk away. All right, so we're back and it took my computer about three minutes to apply this. And you can see that we have all this flickering going on, which is called uh, Z flickering. This is happening because the objects were combined to this base object that we have here, but all the ones in the folder still exist. So the next step is to apply this Boolean operation because right now it's just playing it live. So we'll drop this down and say apply. All right. So now it's done. We can see the Z flickering is still going on. But if I was to turn off the Baker folder, now we see it goes away. So this is really cool. If I zoom into the map, it's now completely empty. So this just means that we combine all these objects down into one single object. If I was to go in here and move this, it's part of that one object. So you can see that we still have some floaters going on here. Uh, so to get rid of those, we just need to go into tab. That's A to select everything and then say P to separate by loose parts. And now it's separated all those objects into their own parts. So if I just press tab to go back to object mode, basically you just want to find your base object and then delete everything else. Now, if you had some trouble where you see some weird intersecting going on here, or there's like a big clump that's not supposed to be here, that's because you have a hole somewhere. And this is what we were trying to clean up early on. So if for some reason you had a hole right here that went deep, it might cause a lot of issues. So if you see that, the best thing to do might be to go back into Gravity Sketch and cover that up. But if you wanted to, you could come in here and try to do it by hand. This is a good example where it's not really supposed to go in here this far. Uh, that's not the cleanest mesh in the world. But for almost this entire thing to be perfectly clean, I'm just going to let that slide. Now, I put this base object in here simply to uh, cut all of this up and make the bottom a lot easier. But now that we've already done our Boolean, I can delete everything here. So I'm just going to go into face mode by pressing three and select all of these silver bits. Great. And now I'm just going to press delete and then say faces. And when we leave editing mode, if I go out, we can see we have this perfectly clean model. So looking at the object, I want to point out that the materials are still there. Even though everything is combined down into a single object, I can go up in here into grass and change the color and it changes all the colors, even though this is not its own object like it was before. So this is huge because this means that we don't necessarily have to texture anything. We could bring this over into Unreal Engine as this single clean object with this like clean interior and be able to modify the colors very easily. So that's one big plus of this. But the other plus side of this is that if we were to go into modifiers and add decimation, we could clean this up even further. So if we look up here in the top left, we can see that we have 69,000 vertices. Before we had about 85,000 or so, so it's already cleaner. But check this out. Let's go to an area where there's a lot of detail so we can see how things are changing. Say around here. And let's bring this ratio for decimation down to 5 or 0.5. So what this does is you can see that our vertice count was just cut in half to 34,000. If I turn this on and off, you can see the materials are still maintained. And we do lose some texture detail or um, mesh detail. But for the most part, it's still pretty efficient. Now, it can get pretty wild if I was to go down to like 0.1. Like, this still looks really good. We're at 7,000 vertices, and this model is really kicking it. So let's try it even further. Let's go to 0 0.05. The base look is still there, and we're down to 3,000 vertices. What about 0 0.01? <laughs> I mean, look at that. This is like you have your the soul of the piece still in there, but we're at 722 vertices. Now, this is huge for game design because this means that we can 
essentially make levels of detail because if you're all the way out here, it doesn't matter if it's this low quality. Like this compared to this isn't that much different from this far away. So you can change this based off of what you're developing for, but around a 0.5 to 0.6 is usually where it retains enough detail, but it's efficient enough to run in a headset. 41,000 vertices is pretty good. Now you do want to remember that you have these other objects in the scene, like the trees and the pathing. And when you run the decimation, it may interfere with your pathing. So you'll probably want to go back and touch that up. The funny thing is, like, I actually like this look. <laughs> this, like, super low poly look. Um, It'd be so funny to put all that effort into adding all that detail, just to launch something at this quality. Now, what's fascinating about going this route of just having the materials baked onto one single object instead of trying to bake the texture onto it is that this also baked our UVs in. So if I was to go into flat mode, you can see that our gradient texture is still working. And if I was actually to go in here and do a quick UV unwrap, you can see that it completely throws off the gradient texture. Now, if you wanted to use some like nice grass and rock textures and everything, like you would definitely want to do this unwrapping and then reapply a different texture so it would work. But in my case, I kind of want to keep this original gradient. So I'm going to keep that in place. So from here, I'm going to go into Photoshop and bake the colors that I want for each material onto their own gradients, re-import those back in, and then we'll check this out in Gravity Sketch. So I went into Photoshop and made a gradient texture, and then I applied a solid color on top with a multiply operation on top so it would blend like this. And then I just did that for like the mud, the treetops, the different grass and rocks, and exported those all out as separate uh, textures. And then back in Blender, I just plugged them right into each of the materials. So if I go into flat mode, flat shaded mode, and turn on texture, you can see all the information is now baked down into the object. So from here, we can now export this into anywhere. We could bring this into Unreal Engine, and the texture will be carried over with the color data, and we don't have to worry about setting that up later. So what I'm going to do from here is send this over to Sketchfab so we can see how to present it in a web viewer. So to get it into Sketchfab, we want to select all of our trees, all of our objects, and then the main map, and go to File, Export, and then FBX. And then in here, you just want to say Selected Objects Only so we don't export out all these other objects that are hidden. And then in path mode, we want to set this to copy and say include textures. And this is just going to make sure that it exports our textures along with the model. And then you press export. Now on Sketchfab, you want to log in and press upload. And then you're just going to drag and drop this file in. It shouldn't take you too long, maybe about like a minute, two minute max. Now that it's ready, I can say edit 3D settings. And there we go. You can see that our whole model was imported in and our texture data was retained. So now we can play around with setting it up to look nice inside of Sketchfab. So we can change the field of view. I'm going to make it a little bit wider to make this scene feel a little bit bigger. Then close that down and then change the background. So I have some images that I've imported in from a while ago. And I really like this one for these kind of environments. It just makes it feel like it's some kind of sky. Um, but yeah, just import in your own and play around with it. And this is where it gets fun. So if I turn on uh, screen space ambient occlusion, you can see that we get a lot more data in the shadows. Now, this is just a post-processing effect, but it gives people an idea of how this kind of object would look in a program like Unreal Engine or something where you can bake the lighting. And then there are annotations, which is like Gravity Sketch's viewpoints, where I can select anywhere on the map, double click, and say start, whatever we want to call that viewpoint, and then say OK. And I go over here and say use the current point of view. That way, if I was to go over here and set another one, then I can go back and forth between the two of these. 
basically you can let someone fly around your map on their own or you can kind of guide them and tell them where your best viewing points are that's pretty much it before you go you want to set your view that's going to be part of the thumbnail so you just go up here and say save view and now we can go save settings and see what it looks like now, if you end up making anything cool with this workflow, make sure to tag me wherever you post it. I'd love to showcase everyone's submissions in a future video. If you join my Patreon, you can download both this final model and the Gravity Sketch files that I used to make it. Otherwise, you can check it out on Sketchfab now, but please consider supporting me via Patreon as that will help ensure that I can make more of these tutorials in the future. And before you go, let me know what else you'd like me to make in Gravity Sketch using this workflow. And let me know which parts of this tutorial you'd like me to go into further detail on. So as always, I'm Emma, this is The Spatial Canvas, and I hope to see you next time.